My name is Greg Conti. I'm a computer security researcher and faculty member at, the, at West Point. That's the United States Military Academy. Uh, I hope to do uh, several things during the talk today. Uh, convince you that the information that uh, the information that we're all giving, both as individuals and companies, to uh, uh, to uh, other online companies, is uh, it's massive and it's dangerous and it's going to get worse before it gets better. Um, and that the, by the process of, of relying on third parties for critical infrastructure and giving them possession of our data um, is, is, is a clear and present danger and it's a risk because that information is coveted and often accessible by a variety of parties, both legitimate and illegitimate. And that, that the compelling ser tools and services that we're passing information that, that cause us to pass information uh, on the network is often visible to uh, networking providers as well and the whole ISP uh, scenario. I am here as a free citizen. And this is my disclaimer. And uh, the background of the slide is where they send people who don't put up uh, their disclaimer. So who's familiar with the AOL data set disclosure of two years ago? So what would you say, about a third of the audience? A third of the audience, something like that? Who's seen the data? OK, so maybe 5% five, five of the audience? So for those of you, uh, I've been studying this problem for about four years uh, pretty, pretty heavily. And I always tried to make the case to tell people, you're giving away a lot of sensitive information via search and what website, uh, by when you're using mapping software, where you're looking. Uh, basically, any online tool and service, you're disclosing some information. And the larger the company, the more services, the more information you're disclosing. And it, it was hard kind of to make the case. So uh, it, it gave a talk, uh, kind of an early talk of this in, uh, in August two, 2006. And three days later, uh, AOL released a very large data set containing the search queries um, for uh, over 600,000 people and about 24 million queries. Uh, and I think that makes the best case. Um, in, in, in a way, it was sad because what they were trying to do was have a facilitate an open research community, but uh, they were nominally uh, anonymized, basically just uh, switched out uh, user IDs uh, with uh, basically handles with uh, usernames with uh, an anonymous number, and it didn't take much to take a set of queries and work back. And I'm and that was soon picked up sites by sites like AOL Stalker and AOL Psycho that uh, went out there. I mean, this was in the public domain, so they just added a web front end and people could go out there and search to their heart's content. So let's just, as we move forward, I, I want to convince you that we're giving away a lot of sensitive information. And think of this uh, as just one vector across many vectors. Any online tool or service, you're giving something away whether it's a free email service, whether it's mapping, whether it's, I mean, just any, any conceivable, and I have examples uh, in here. So this is just one of many of hundreds of potential uh, different paths. And again, this is in the public domain, and this is AOL user 2708. Okay, and the, the deletions are my deletions. Let's see where that one's going. <laughs> okay. 
I'm sure this guy got a lot of CDs. And, and free porn MPEGs from an anonymous dress. So I, I didn't edit this down significantly so that you can kind of sick, see this mixture of mundane in with uh, this kind of ongoing theme of revenge. So, and again, it's difficult with contact. With context, this person could have been writing a story, or this could have been part of someone's life. But as we move forward with this talk, I think just this and there's other examples. I mean, they're all out there. They're for the world to see, which is a bad thing. Um, and they're not being anonymized necessarily. I mean, the, the raw data sets out there. And when you look at the, this is just search, and this was just search over 90 days. So I did a survey of, uh, of college students, 352 college students, about five months after the fact. And surprisingly, I, I thought it was surprisingly because to me this was big news. If it's on Slashdot, you're, you, know, you can almost assume that it's common knowledge in the tech, tech community. But for the average college student, 84% uh, hadn't heard of it at all, 7% vaguely. And this was short at, shortly after the event. And only 2% two, two were, were familiar with it. So you've got this context. Even something like that, which was uh, picked up by mainstream media and was about as loud a bang as we've had, uh, still didn't get people's attention. So in this talk today, the. I'm uh, dividing up into several uh, main, main sections. The first is covering the types of information disclosure. And I think it's useful to take a step back is just the generic idea of information, how information flows out of your computer, and then how it goes across the network, and uh, the impact of websites and ISPs on that chain. The different vectors that we're uh, using, both uh, some current ones and where things are going. And uh, the idea of cross-site tracking, because that's an integral part of this, that the idea that if you think you're going from one website to another and no one's detecting that, uh, you're probably mistaken. So I may use the term Googling. I'm using it in the, term, the, the uh, dictionary sense uh, with a little g. And, the, and I'm using it broadly in, in, to refer to the wide range of uh, free online tools and services. And when I say web-based information disclosure, that's things that users, uh, you and I, type into uh, or share with third parties, and it's often stored on someone else's servers. And, and this is a key, a key tenet that uh, the, I argue that the free web tools and services uh, that are out there, they're not free. We're, we're paying for them with micropayments of, of our personal information. And a, a result of that study, and I have a link to it at the end where I had the statistics from, uh, the takeaway we had there, the conclusion we came to, is that it, users aren't... It, entirely oblivious to the fact that the information is being collected, but they're doing a cost-benefit analysis. But it's one of those short-time cost-benefit analysis, like I'll give you a free candy bar in return for your password. And they're, they're not thinking long-term years and decades. Sen sensitive information, and I, I thought this is very ironic because this is Elliot Spitzer, the former governor of New York, who resigned under a prostitution scandal. Um, and he was just pointing out the, the sensitivity of electronic trails people leave behind. And he, as well as uh, Mark Foley, a uh, former U.S. congressman, who was, all, who was uh, brought down by uh, electronic trail he left behind. Uh, I don't want to read this, but you can get the idea. It was, it was the classic chatting with, uh, using instant messaging with a, an intern kind of thing, a male intern. But more importantly, it's, it's, the, it's the end users. I mean, like people in this room, I, you're savvy folks, and you know how to defend yourselves. 
the, the, the broader populace doesn't. So the, part of the reason of being here today is to kind of get engender some discussion and, and, and move, uh, move forward and seek solutions because largely the, the population out there is, is defenseless. And uh, I'll just read the top one. Can anyone help me, please? This stalking thing, and she's referring to the AOL stalker site, so she saw her stuff out there. It, this thing is not funny at all. When I type in my name, uh, I, Tame, it gives lists of places that show where I've been on AOL on the net. This is nobody's business. I've done, I have not done anything wrong at all, and I've contacted AOL about this matter, and they keep saying they will do something about it, but never do. And what she doesn't get is it's in the public domain, and there's really, it's, it's game over at that point. Uh, Sally at the bottom said, how do I get stuff removed from AOL Stalker? Can anyone tell me? AOL won't respond even though they claim willingness to remove data when requested. Someone, anyone, please help. And, and it's a shame because AOL was, on one hand, and was trying to facilitate an open research community and they just missed the mark on what they were sharing. So there's ongoing research on, on better ways to anonymize data and it's hurt the research community. But at the same time, I mean, it, this, this thing hurt a lot of people. And this is all in the, a, a very complex environment where, uh, where governments worldwide, oftentimes the cost of doing business is, com well, the cost of doing business is complying with local rules and regulations and laws. And that makes for, and laws and governments and environments vary in each country you go to. And there's been examples here. There's a far-reaching request for uh, search query data from the Department of Justice. There's an incident where uh, uh, an, an Indian man had posted disparaging comments and, and the local governments uh, pushed on Google hard to, to share information. Another man uh, posted a fake Facebook profile about a, one of the country's leaders and was jailed. Um, I mean, it, the list goes on and on. And most recently it was the, uh, the request by when uh, Google was ordered to give over, like, all its YouTube user data to Viacom. Now, that's since been, uh, I think, brought within to the realm of reason. But and just the fact that this stuff exists, it's like a personal diary. Your personal diary of yourself, groups that you belong to, and your companies and other organizations, they're all out there on someone else's servers. And the law, and I'm not a lawyer, but the law is, my understanding is the law is different. Information on your computer has a certain degree of protection. Information on someone else's computer that you've already shared has a, le a less uh, lessened degree of protection. And like I said, the situation is going to get worse before it gets better. Uh, this is an example, uh, and I debated putting it in there because it's kind of hard. It's New York Times, stati New York Times statistics based on com Comscore data, and it was kind of hard to backtrack and be able to defend each individual number. Uh, but what, this is a chart of the number of times data is collected on each visitor in a month by a number of online companies. And uh, the, from uh, at one end of the of the spectrum was Yahoo, where they claimed 2,500 um, pieces of information were collected on each visitor in a month, and and you see all the major players out there have are, are collecting data. That was the the point here. And at the same time, there are millions of visitors. The scale on the left tops out at 180 million. And sites like Yahoo, AOL, Google, they're all approaching 160 million. And getting, getting hard numbers out of companies is difficult. So I'm not saying these are the exact numbers, but I think they're a reasonable estimate for discussion today, that there are millions, perhaps hundreds of millions of visitors to these sites and large amounts of information is being collected. And this is an environment where there's only 20% internet um, penetration. So in Asia, which has, the, has 518 million users, and you can see Europe, North America, it's only, globally it's only 20% penetration. So it's going to get worse. And it's going, another driving factor beyond, behind that is the number, is the ubiquity of computing devices. It's not just desktops and laptops anymore. The world population is 6.6 .6 billion, and this past year, the number of cell phones uh, accounts uh, crossed the, half the world's population, so 3.3 billion cell phones. And where, what's the trend with those? More and more power, embedded uh, location um, aware technologies and web browsing capabilities, they're becoming small computers unto themselves. 
there has been some progress that came out of the AOL um, incident, and kind of it, there's this flurry of activity, and, and then after after a period of time, uh, there was was some movement specifically on uh, data retention of search queries. So ask uh, ask.com took a very um, uh, strong leap forward. They have an ask eraser service where uh, they it, it's hard their law their policy states that they'll just retain the data for hours before it's uh, discarded. And Google, Microsoft, and, and Yahoo also came out with policies at which point they would anonymize their data. And, and please, as I'm walking around the con, I've been researching this hard and I want to continue doing so. Uh, if you have more current information, please, please let me know. Uh, same thing with logs. I found this all these public statements, all the news just surrounded search queries and some about cookies. But as far as all the other range of products and services offered by these companies, I, I, I couldn't really find anything. And, and the absence makes me wonder if, if, if there is anything, any anonymization built into a policy there. As well as, I mean, other companies. These are just the big ones in the spotlight. What are, what are the second tier players doing? And also the idea uh, of the, the cookie fallacy, and that's what I call it, in that they changed, you know, there's this Google cookies would expire after um, in 2038 or something like that, 2038, uh, but in, and they moved it back to two years. But in general, the idea of changing expiration time down to two years still really doesn't make that much difference because it's, it's typical in an online company, they just update your cookie when you visit. So you'd have to not go there for two years. I think your computer, you know, would would blow up, and you get it uh, before, uh, you and you get a new cookie that way before the a, an expired cookie would matter. And also uh, ISPs, and if you have some good sources or links on the data retention, public data retention slash anonymization policies. I mean, I've, I've done some reading, and there's a little bit out there, but if you've got some nice sources, please send them my way because I do wonder about ISPs as well. And I said the, the, the situation's complex because on one hand, you've got user data um, and companies, it helps. It provides a competitive advantage. Uh, and it, you see, but it's important to realize, and this is, a, I think, another uh, conclusion that I came to, is that you just are seeing the tip of the iceberg. When you're using a search engine to pull out information, say you're Google hacking or you're using Johnny Long's Google hacking techniques or something like that, you're only seeing a small fraction of the entire, of the entire database. That's, so there's this publicly available portion and then there's uh, the, the private portion. And, and presumably it's, it's well, well protected, but just the fact that it exists um, is significant and, and, a, and a major concern. And you see little things like eBay, you can click and see what a given user has bought. And that's probably 0.001% of what they actually have on folks. And the same thing with, uh, with Amazon. That you, you see it manifests itself in when they make recommendations to you on what to, what to purchase. And you get insights into the, you know, their data, mo data mining. So this information is valuable, and, but there's this tension where you're, you're, you, you know, what I'd like to see is almost no data retention, and on, but that's a personal opinion. On the other hand, the business cases, this stuff it makes for a competitive advantage. And that's the environment that we're working in. At the same time, this information, uh, there's uh, companies are working very hard to, hard to profile people so as to better uh, target advertising. And this, the two examples on the left are Tacoma and are, are Tacoma, where they've uh, have examples of a career watcher and an active gamer, and they have all sorts of happy examples. But uh, I can, fi I think there's much more uh, realistic and scary ones that are entirely possible that concern, you know, would concern you. How hard would it be to, to profile someone as a Google hacker? How hard would it be to profile someone as a security researcher, um, a political activist for a given party, as a, a, a person with AIDS or a cancer survivor, um, a, a corporate leader, uh, a, cor a spouse of a corporate leader perhaps, a law enforcement officer, a government official? I mean, the whole spectrum of profiling is possible. I like. I debated putting this in there, but because we're, what we're doing is talking about information flows on the internet. But I think it's useful to consider just information flows into and out of your computer. And I try to be comprehensive and think think through the entire range of possibilities information can flow into and out of. And and really, the the primary way is the wired network, uh, or you know your wire. It's your internet connection. That's how information flows in and out. But as security professionals, it's just useful to take your information can leave 
your premises in a variety of ways. So if you've got your personal computer, and imagine you drew a, a circle around it in chalk or something like that, or actually this would be more like a sphere, but you can't draw spheres with chalk. Um, the power line. And so you, when you have physical wires connecting the, your computer to something else, information could very well flow. And there's a wide range of ch side channel attacks that have shown that information can flow in a variety of ways, and there's often value in it. And, and we know that there's networking across power lines. So we know information can flow in the presence of power. Personally, I don't think there's much there because, and I've talked to some electrical engineers who say there's a great deal of filtering by power supply. So the idea of information leaking out the power, your power line is unlikely. But it's useful just to kind of think broadly on the subject. And, and clearly phone lines, uh, you know, modems and the like. Uh, the electromagnetic emissions, Tempest, you know, is the government standard for reducing uh, electromagnetic munition, uh, emissions. Some are deliberate, as in a wireless you know, connectivity. Others, uh, I mean, it's the bane of computer engineers worldwide that, that uh, electronic emanations can screw, can, uh, can screw up computation or, or communication on a variety of, of undesirable uh, paths. Sound, researchers have uh, found that just by hearing the typing of someone, they can identify keystrokes to a high degree of accuracy. So it's useful to think about that. Things, people, uh, th things go move in and out across that boundary. Uh, when your connections to peripherals, and then, of course, people, both what they carry and what's in their head. And back to the wired network. Now, th those threats, that emanation of information, occurs uh, on your PC, but it also can occur across any, any pair of no any node on the network. I mean, it's a computing device, and actually the, the link between the two. Uh, before it actually gets to the server of the online company. And we have, we'll have some examples down the road uh, in the talk where We'll talk about the capabilities of ISPs. Oh, here we go. So it, it's useful to consider the, the vantage point of a large online company versus the vantage point of, of an, a large ISP. A, an online company get, receives traffic globally, so, but they're not seeing, um, it's from many cu customers, but it's dispersed. Uh, they may be part of an advertising network that brings in additional information so they can see activities off their computer itself. Uh, and they have limited knowledge of user identity. In some cases, I clear if you have a registered account or you purchase something. And, and usually the business model includes the capability to do extensive data mining. Contrast that with an ISP. Well, uh, an ISP sees traffic from all uh, of its customers. Except, uh, except encrypted traffic, usually, although there are capabilities and there's business products to do SSL man in the middle. And it doesn't have uh, visibility of, obviously, it only knows its customers, not everyone else's, where the online company sees a global swath. But what they do know, and this is important, they know the identity and location of accounts. So they know who signed up for what, where it is. They typically have a wire run to the computer or to the wireless access point, and they have that critical piece of information. Historically, ISPs have been essentially a utility, like water, providing you electronic uh, networking to your home. That's changed of late, and I have a couple of examples later on. But what they do is they have the power to, uh, to manipulate the flow of information into and out of, their uh, out of your computer, and they're using it. Here's an example. This is Roadrunner. And, uh, and what Roadrunner does is if you mistype a URL, they redirect you. And so they're, they're able to know, um, they, they redirect you to an ad laden page. So they're able to control your information flow. And Google, I'm sorry, this is uh, out of the Canadian ISP Rogers, a uh, screenshot from Lauren Weinstein's uh, website. And what they did is they added advertisements. As, as the web browsing occurred, they added a, a, an advertisement as a header on, they were testing that out. So again, I mean, we can't rely on just the integrity of the flows into and out of online companies. So it's the, the cool, new, or compelling tools that are out there that we use that are what encourage us to disclose information. And counterintuitively, the easier they are, the, uh, the more we're compelled to release sensitive information. 
So there's traditional ones, such as search, communications, uh, and the like. But there's also uh, you get, getting in, and then the advertising networks. But there's also, like, you take a close look at what the Web 2.0 innovations are bringing on and what there's some fundamental shifts taking place. So think the trend away, f away from the desktop. The idea of moving software, the, your office suite software off to someone else's servers. And there's been some, uh, some movement, but in general, the tool resides with someone else and the, your data is stored somewhere else. Generally, that's a bad idea, <coughs> even if you maintain a local copy. Mashups, location-based services, social networking. It's useful to think of each of those in regard to the information you're disclosing. And finally, with cloud computing looming on the horizon, I think it's important for all of us to think about the privacy implications and threats coming from that as well. So just to, to flip through a few different examples of things we're uh, disclosing information through, uh, this is from simply Google, which is a consolidation of, uh, I mean, basically it's just useful to, it shows all Google's, the, the variety of different search uh, facets that it provides. So that's just one, uh, one example. Uh, mapping systems. If you imagine your corporate headquarters and your, your administrative staff, where, what are they doing MapQuest results for? What does that look like when aggregated over time? What if you're looking at a particular region of the world uh, to do some, you're flying a VIP out to a particular region? Chances are they're doing Map, MapQuest or some mapping type search to provide a nice little packet to hand to the boss. Then, then there's uh, the, the idea of, uh, I mean, I, and, and this is actually a two-edged sword. What you, it's kind of like an extension of mapping. Where are you looking at in, say, these 3D world, the uh, street view type, type products? But it's also the contents of the images themselves. So it's a double-edged sword. It's what you're disclosing and the fact that they're actively collecting the information. The fact that the, uh, it, perhaps there, there's movement afoot to anonymize tools like street view. But my understanding is that's just anonymizing the public view. You, you have to wonder, what about the original source data? Is that being anonymized as well? Tools like LinkedIn, which a lot of people uh, around this place use, and sites like that know your contact and your contact's contacts. Uh, but it, it, sometimes, you know, particularly when I have an old friend that sends a note and contacts me through LinkedIn, I feel like a bit of my privacy has died because now a third party knows that I know this person. Sites like Craigslist, browser behavior. Say, for example, you went to it and you're searching for personal ads. Um, you, know, you visit Las Vegas and you're searching for personal ads. You send it, FP, FTT, FTP replacement service. Very cool, you upload a file, they send you a URL, and you can send that URL to others so you can m send very large files. But, and again, this is an example of you should consider the information disclosed through each of these, each of these services. You're uploading a file, a big file, perhaps an important, important file, to someone else's servers. What happened to it's there? Uh, what happens to it there depends on their privacy, privacy policy and, and luck. Even the most innocuous site, and I, one, I think it's personally it's a great time to be alive that there's a rot13.com. But, and, and I'm not, I mean, I think it's cool, and I don't, but the idea is that any site you're pushing information into is prob could very well be collecting it and retaining it, and particularly the ones that have business models dependent on it. And just another example, the fact that you, you as an individual listed a, uh, you, this, is, this is Google's page where you, you type in a link, like this should be indexed by Google. When you do that, you're, we're going back to data mining and linking between individuals. But what you're doing is creating a strong link between you and your cookie or your registered user account and a given website. And this is something I'm not sure how much, I mean, I know people are aware in general, but I'm not sure how much we're moving forward. And I have a suggestion, I think, on how to make this better. But it's no longer just being logged by an individual website. Uh, it's been, I mean, obviously there's been cookies and web bugs and things like that for a while. But it's usual, I think it's getting worse. And let's take a look. So refer values tell you where you've come, tell the site where you've come from. Click-through tracking tells the site, if they, if they do so, it's using JavaScript, it tells you where you're going next. Uh, obviously, there's cookies. Um, and sometimes it's, it's interesting that sites 
are using uh, like Ajax technology. So what you see the first uh, first time isn't showing you uh, that if you do view source, you're not seeing the actual source. The source can be updated as as you go along. There's information sharing agreements, uh, advertising networks are consolidating web bugs, and then probably the most concerning is the idea of third-party content, because I don't think a lot of people realize. When you, if you embed third-party content on your web page, that is that's pulling, say, a YouTube video from a, 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 from a server. So you visit that page, it's, it, they can track that person. Anytime you go to a site with an embedded video from a common source, they can track you as you hit one of those sites. Web analytics services and like the same. And just an example. I know uh, Amazon's affiliate network, they have, uh, when you do text links, they have uh, basically web bugs that are pulled from their servers, at least last time I checked. And then also you're seeing relationships between large parties. So th this is an example of eBay pulling ads from a Yahoo server. So you're seeing relationships where, say you have a company you don't want anything to do with, you may be surprised. This is an example. Um, I did create a tool called Roomit, which is a security visualization tool. It shows network traffic. And on this left, on that white line, it plots locations on, um, basically it's a, uh, on a scale from 0 .0 0.0.0.0 at the bottom all the way up to 255.255, et cetera. So that's like a scale. You can plot a point on there and show the, uh, an IP address. So that was my computer. And I turned it on when I visited uh, Microsoft, uh, MSNBC's website. And you can see the green lines. Okay, so there's a cluster of files at the top, and just zooming in. Each dot represents a packet that went off, and then another cluster, another set of packets, and another cluster, and another set of packets. And I just, I wasn't sure if you'd be able to see them, so that kind of highlights the major regions. So it turns out when you visit, and that's the site on the left, you're not just visiting one site, you visited 16 third party sites. And I went out and looked each of them up. Ten of them are from different companies. And this is a, a common practice. And right now we can detect, detect it because they're going to third-party sites. I mean, the, site, the company itself could, um, could manage this internally and it would be invisible. But for now, we can see it. And because you're visiting so many sites, and I have a, a, a friend suggested this idea to me, uh, the idea of the least common denominator. And this is a big deal. Like one site may have a strong policy, but you're really dealing with the lowest common denominator privacy policy when many sites are involved, which is, which is significant. So is there a browser plugin that easily shows third-party contact. So what I'm thinking is like in, in Firefox, in the status bar at the bottom, you visit a site, and it'll just show you a number, like 12. And you click the drop-down, it shows you everywhere else you visited. Has anyone seen anything like that? No script? And it's, is it pretty seamlessly integrated in to the interface? OK, cool, thanks. And you may be familiar with, uh, I mean, people are, have been aware of the problem, and even the Black Hat uh, keynote speaker uh, suggested something along these lines. Uh, if, you've, if you're familiar with Track Me Not, the idea is that it inserts spurious search queries, and idea, the idea is to mask your, the real, uh, your real queries from the fake queries. I, I think, well, I think there are many issues with it, uh, and, I, and I don't know if it'll ultimately be successful, and you'll probably anger a lot of online companies by just continually sending streams. Uh, but I found it interesting that the Black Hat uh, speaker suggested not just for search, but because of profiling and the like, we need to do this across as many different avenues, across many different websites as possible. I don't know if it'll go there. The idea is to break up profiles to, to spoil profiles, which again, there's this balance. The business models are built on them. That's why these services are free. On the other hand, there, there's this tension. So uh, it, interesting. And, and as we walk around the con, I'd be interested in your thoughts on that. So there has been some progress. Uh, there have been attempts at raising user awareness. Uh, the business world is looking at data leak prevention. Um, there's been the search query anonymization I've mentioned. And then this is a little off topic, but th what Google did with the uh, malware warnings when a site was suspicious, um, it would give you a warning in the search results. And they even, the I'm feeling lucky button, you click, it wouldn't automatically take you to a malicious site. It would, it would take you to another page. So this, uh, see, there's users and then there's DEF CON attendees. So you aren't, uh, you're savvy computer folks, and uh, 
two different, two different animals. But this is an example that would probably throw you into anaphylactic shock. Uh, if you watched the video, it nearly killed me when I watched it. Um, but it's kind of like this happy version of how cookies work. Um, but, but it's a, a step forward. It's a step forward raising user awareness. And there's a change here that's been positive. Can anyone tell me what it is? What's that? Yeah, good. So this is a, a recent change where they've added the privacy policy to the front page. But there's also many challenges. Electronic discovery, is, is it's an ongoing battlefield. And the idea of the information you've provided is out there, and, and comp, uh, our courts are trying to get a hold of it, among many others. A great deal of software phones home. There's dependency. When you outsource critical infrastructure, such as your email, to a third party, it, that could be a problem, particularly if it's a free service and it could go away at any point in time. New products and services will, uh, can, you know, as they come out, you have to evaluate them for what you're giving away and what you're getting back in return. Companies consolidate, as you saw with Google and do DoubleClick, but also companies die. And this is heresy, but one day Google will die. And it may be 250 years from now, or maybe seven years from now, but uh, what happens to the data when companies die is a big question. Uh, Web 2.0 provides a greater resolution. Before you type things into a form and click, if you, before you click submit, you're safe. But now, uh, I mean, this, this increased ability to track what people are, are pointing to, what people are, are doing uh, with a finer resolution is, is a major concern. And this is the general trend away from the desktop out into the cloud. So I think it's a useful way to analyze this to look at, uh, kind of create a spectrum from likely to less likely things, all of which are possible. Uh, some are like more likely, some are ongoing, and some are not. Your, your placement of these may vary a little, so please don't nitpick me on the locations, but I think you'll get the idea. So likely things, cross-site tracking. I showed example that 18 or a large number of sites by visiting Microsoft or MSNBC. User profiling is ongoing, targeting advertising is ongoing. We've seen redirection when you mistype a URL. Sharing with third parties and government collaboration is, is, I think, is an ongoing thing, certainly in certain parts of the world then less likely, it's almost like most frequent and less frequent. Um, the idea of ISPs manipulating traffic, a service being eliminated that you depend on. Uh, search results theoretically could be modified, and I know search engine optimization tries to do that, but the company itself could do that, and some of them do for pay. I mean, it's a, a business model. And of course, data spills. One of the things I think is most interesting um, is the idea of digital assassination. The, when you cede so much information to a third party or a number of third parties, you've given up control, you've given up power. And what could they do with that power? Right now, it might not be a big deal, but as we move forward, you wonder, could they take down a president? Could, could they alter the course of an election? Could they ruin your life if they were so inclined? That's a lot of power to place in someone else's hands. So lots of people I'd like to thank, and let me explain the first one. Uh, I have a friend who decided it would be a neat idea to uh, turn his, uh, his name slash handle into a hash. So uh, it's a, I thought it was a neat, a neat idea. So lots of people provided feedback. And here's a, a number, this is like I said, I've been doing this for a number of years and what I've tried to do today is just draw, uh, kind of synthesize it all, give you the highlights of what, what's been occurring and where it could very well be going and why you should care. Uh, I'd like to make a, a plug for Davix, which is a security visualization um, live CD. The hard part with security visualization tools is that they're often a pain in the butt to, to configure and um, install. And uh, Jean, uh, Jan Monsch and Rafi Marty have done it. So uh, there's a workshop, 2 to 4 p.m. on Sunday at a, De a DEF CON breakout room. So if you're interested in that, and you also have the image if they want to get a hold of it. So they've got like 25 on one. They've did the, they're done uh, 25 on the CD. Also, I started off saying that free web tools and services aren't free, uh, but there's also something else. We are also paying for them by tolerating evil interfaces. 
right? You've probably all encountered evil interfaces on the web, things that trick you, lie to you, send you in the wrong direction, uh, bounce up and down over top of the contents and the like. So I'm trying to, to dig into that a little bit and uh, doing a, a survey. So I have a little bit of West Point swag. If anyone would fill out a, a, a one, piece, one piece of paper, circle some numbers, we'll give you some swag, and your name is not on it, it would be greatly appreciated because it's looking at countermeasures people employ, and I think you're the best folks out there for employing countermeasures. So with that, are there any questions? Is there a mic for questions, or is there not a mic? Oh, I'm sorry, yes. Uh, is the information you just gave on the DEF CD? Uh, the question was, is the information on the DEF CON CD, the, the PowerPoint presentation, it's uh, an early version. I mean, we had to submit it 30 days ago, and I've been working on it since. I'll, I'll put it up on my website, which is uh, roommate.org. Uh, you may have heard that uh, SIGINT stands for Signals Intelligence, IMINT stands for Image Intelligence, and, and roommate is intelligence community slang for rumor intelligence. So R-U-M-I-N-T.org. Uh, you just search my name. It'll come up, and I'll have them up there when I get back. Other questions? Okay, um, back there. So what's the solution? Ah. There, I think what we're seeing are piecemeal solutions, right? Uh, and I think that's a step forward. I think the best part is colla uh, collaborative solutions. I think the large online companies have to be part of the solution itself. It would be nice to see uh, summer of code type tools. And, and one thing I feel is self-awareness. The idea, if you allow people to easily monitor themselves what they're doing, that will allow them to make more informed decisions. But I think it's a, it's a two. I mean, it's on the policy front. It's on uh, individual companies have to take steps forward. Uh, end users have to be made aware. It's an ongoing pro uh, direction forward. So part of it is to come out here and and jointly seek solutions. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, locate the, what he mentioned was GPS-based systems. And I, ju just listening to uh, you know, business news this past week, and I think it was the Oracle C CEO was just very excited about the idea of location-based systems and GPS is being embedded in many devices. So what you have is this whole other uh, concern of information we give, and another piece of that is where you are at any given point in time, and that can be scary. Oh, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, he, the, he said the cell phone already does that. Okay, so I'll take uh, questions. Uh, in, there's a question and answer room. I'm happy to sit down and talk with anybody, and I thank you for your time.